your web coordinator at globalnews.ca. Um, I've been working on, uh, since I started in February, working on producing and researching interactive maps. Um, and those of you are familiar with what I've been doing at uh, OpenFile and the Star and so forth, won't be totally surprised what I've been working on for global. Um, I started in February, and I, uh, we're just, we've been in a sort of research phase in terms of, uh, in terms of launching a whole, lot of, a whole generation of new interactive map projects. Uh, and we're just starting to now be into a research and production phase, or we're searching where we want to be a couple of months from now, and then also starting to roll out a whole lot of whole new series of maps. Um, the big difference in what I've been doing before is that a whole lot of these map projects have, are, are focused on Western Canada. Uh, Global is a strong presence in uh, Alberta and BC, and I've been having a new for me experience with dealing with uh, the FOI regimes in, uh, in uh, British Columbia and Alberta. It's a whole, a whole, a whole new world. It's a, lot, it's a lot of fun. But um, actually, the best part of it is we get to reuse a lot of a lot of things that have worked well in Ontario. It's nice from that point of view. So I can I can say uh, so a lot of a lot of the global. If you're following these map projects, a lot of it's going to be rolling out in the next in the next month or two until until that happens. In a limited amount, I can say, except for the one we're showing off tonight. Um, before I was hired by Global, I was uh, I did a lot of work for uh, about six months of work for uh, for OpenFile.ca. I saw Kathy Kathy Bay around earlier. Um, it uh, really sort of having a sort of professional sabbatical, which is very nice, financed by a buyout I took from the Star last summer. Um, the two map projects, uh, two big map projects I ended up working on for OpenFile were uh, baby name maps. Some of you may have seen for Ontario, uh, baby special code and where the Owens are, and where the Logans are, and where the, it's, it's, well, it's a lot of fun, it's very popular. Um, and uh, the more serious one was a map of uh, every Second World War casualty uh, that we could find in Toronto down to the household level, and there were about 3,300 of them. And it was, a, it was a very, very striking visual of this poppy scattered all over the map of the city. Um, the, uh, for that, moving backwards, uh, I was a web editor at the Star for about 10 years. And uh, toward the last couple of years of that period, I ran a blog called Map of the Week, which uh, the, ended up with about 1.4 million page views. And the, the maps we had most fun with at the Star, once again, were, uh, were FOI driven. We'd file an FOI request, we'd come back with original data and map it. I was quite ruthless. There's a bit of a conflict of interest. I was also a web editor, but I was quite ruthless about pinning interactive maps to stories on the same topic. And that's really where the great bulk of our traffic came from, is that we had a drunk driving map. And whenever there was a story about drunk driving, I would pin the drunk driving map to the drunk driving story. So while there was a small community of people who were interested in maps, who say, look at our interesting maps, there was a much larger community of people who could say, well, you're interested in dogs. Here's a story about dogs. Look at our dog ownership maps. You're interested in infectious disease. Here are infectious disease, disease maps. Um, Still have that one? Yes, we do. <laughs> Look at patrickpain.ca. You can see all the infectious disease maps. That you um, the formula generally for a lot of these projects was, and the infectious disease maps are a great example, um, where we would go to a public agency and say, basically, look, we know you have a database, for example, of reports, reports of infectious disease submitted by medical officers of health, the Ministry of Health, that are required to go on. And there are all kinds of barriers to ever releasing that. I actually believe that the citizens really don't want that to be released. It's medical and privacy reasons, or legal reasons, all kinds of reasons. But we don't want to see the whole database. What we just want to see is the first three characters of the postal code of the patient and the name of the disease. And all of a sudden, that is releasable because you just have the name of the disease and the knowledge that 32 people with that disease live in this postal code. We can produce a drunk driving map because all the, the database of the MTO of drivers whose licenses have been suspended for impaired, you know, is there are various privacy concerns about releasing that. If all you want to see is the first three characters of the postal code, then it becomes releasable. And so it's been a very, it's been a very successful, successful formula we've used on like a lot of, really a lot of, a lot of requests. Um, just looking very quickly at this map, which uh, we're sure going to be doing something with this week, I think, probably. Um, this is, I'm sure you've been sitting here wondering what this map is of. Um, 
this is every intersection in the city of Toronto with more than 500 pedestrians a day, signalized intersection, graded by their uh, accident history, their pedestrian accident history over the last 10 years. Um, it's an interesting pattern. What we're, what, we, what we're able to do is take the, the number of accidents over a 10-year period and divide that by the number of, or the other way around, whichever it is, by the, by the count of the, the actual city counts the pedestrian is going through the intersection to decide what kind of signalization they need, whether you need a longer pedestrian light or no pedestrian light or whatever it happens to be, um, to, rate, to, to create a ratio of the accidents by the number of actual pedestrians. So um, it's, a, it's a better way of doing it than just counting accidents. The uh, in Florence Spadina has, you know, over time lots of pedestrian accidents, but also tens of thousands of pedestrians a day. So they found a successful way of excluding that. So as you can see, there's the, the areas of Scarborough have a lot. Um, parts of a, the Albion Road has quite a few. But there's also areas that are relatively relatively safe by, by, you know, by the volume of the actual pedestrians. Sorry, what did the colors mean? Oh, sorry. Uh, excuse me, I should have mentioned that. The red, the red are the more dangerous than the whiter, the whiter safer. Well, eventually have a key that will hmm. explain that. Um, this is a version of the same data with the 100 most dangerous pedestrian intersections in Toronto map. Um, I'm so sorry this isn't a live version of the data. I kind of cheated a bit. These are actually uh, produced by a radius, the script for producing radius is the design to actually indicate 300 meters around something or 500 meters, whatever it is. What I've done is I've gone into Excel and tied that to the data so the larger the larger the, the, the radius, the greater the, the greater the, the sort of the danger in effect, the greater the dangerousness of the intersection. Um, so we can pick out I mean at Albion Road, for example, we have a row of a row of quite dangerous intersections, the pocket around here on Anglinton, just say the other side of the Allen, there's a pocket around here. But in general, the downtown area is relatively relatively safe. Um, We've been fairly successful. I, I, the FOI system is interesting. It's a, um, you have to deal with bureaucrats in their own language. Uh, the financial aspect of it is quite bizarre. It's sort of surreal economics. Um, sometimes you get charged for things, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you do get charged for things you could have been charged for, but no one says anything, so why should I? Patrick? Yes. Can you explain um, FOI to the hackers excuse, in the room? Excuse me. The, uh, the, access to information system where you formally request a document from the level of government using the various access to information laws that exist. Um, you must have heard this referred to on the news now and then, the documents when they obtain for access to information. Um, sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you get part of what you want. Sometimes they charge you, sometimes they don't. Um, there's usually some sort of fee, but for more complex results, you can be charged you know, at a couple hundred dollars. Uh, sometimes, but the, the, the economics of it is quite arbitrary. I got uh, identical, identical spreadsheets from BC and Alberta, and then down to the, exactly the level of information that was released recently. And BC charged me five hundred dollars, and Alberta gave it away for free. So I, there's no, it's quite, it's quite um, uh, so quite often, quite often we have very good level of cooperation, sometimes we don't. I'm still chasing a request I filed in the Ontario level of Ontario government in April 2008, which I was given, I, I was denied. Uh, I was given access to by the Information and Privacy Commission was adjudicated, so the appeal level is set up in Ontario. Um, so, this, so the appeal decision went in my favor. The Ministry of Concern is uh, decided to take that to judicial review, and we are in court at Osgoode Hall next week. Um, so I'm more than a little intimidated by this. <laughs> so, I want a chicken to go. So we have 38 seconds for questions. <laughs> no, 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 no. We have, we'll open the questions afterwards. Okay. Are you, we can wrap up. Okay. Gus, isn't this open, open the medium? You know, is it free? I mean, it's part of public domain.